student group at the university found out that we have a particular theology of sexuality and they they decided that meant we were bigots and we hated lgbtqia but for the people that you're saying precisely like the digital natives these younger generations are unable to connect with real humans if i'm a product in the internet Am I a product? Sexuality and sex and sexual intimacy has been so perverted by the internet, essentially. I love it. Welcome to Christian Podcasts in America. I'm Beto Gudinho. I was smuggled into the U.S. not to bring Bibles to this country, but to bring Jesus back to America. Our sole purpose and intention in this show is to save American souls and American souls only. <laughs> okay, my friends. Welcome to the show. You guys know me. I'm Beto Gudiño, and I'm drinking amazing coffee. This cup of coffee. I love coffee. You love coffee. And you can support the show by getting one of these coffee mugs. Go to visit christianpodcast.com. Help me save America. Would you? You would. All right. Well, you heard it from the man, Mr. J. Kim. I'm so excited to have him again on the show. It's been a while. I think yeah. it was during 2020 or 2021. But man, yep. thank you so much for being here again. This is wonderful. You have like Analog Christian. Is that like the sequel to Analog Church? Uh, yeah, it's a, a sort of. It's a bit of a follow up. Yeah, the first book was written primarily to church leaders and pastors. But this book is a follow up in that it expands on the ideas. But it's for everybody. Yeah, most people. Okay, so you were saying you're inspired. But you were saying that there's also a damage that's been done. And I'm assuming you're talking about maybe like the social media, what's been going on maybe in the last 10, 12 years with social media in the world. And what or what is the damage that you see happening? What is the problem? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just me. You know, there's a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt um, who he co-wrote the book the coddling of the American mind, which was like a New York Times bestseller. He he, uh, you know, posted something on social media, ironically, not that long ago, like a, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, about um, he showed this chart, this graph. You know, anybody could go online and look it up um, uh, about the. Uh, I think it was first in he he first mentions it in um, the social dilemma that documentary. Mm. Uh, that's like really popular on Netflix, but he he also posted it recently. Uh, this chart that shows sort of a dramatic increase in this is really dark, but it's just facts. Um, a, a dramatic increase in um, suicide attempts, suicidal thoughts, and actual suicide committed amongst younger people. You know, uh, and and there it's per, it's a pretty steady trend line. And then right around 2007, 2008, I think you see this in, insane spike. I mean, a really shocking spike. And it actually correlates with the rise of social media. Now, it's not one-to-one. -one, you know, It's difficult to say, well, social media is all to blame. I think there's way more than that. But um, it is fair to say that social media has certainly done something to culture, and especially to those who are digital natives, You know, young people, Um, uh, millennials in particular, and then uh, Gen Z, especially, and now, you know, Gen Alpha or or whatever you want to call them. They're Gen uh, Alpha? I didn't know that. That's new I to think me. that's what people call them. Yeah, I don't know. What? It changes all the time. So okay. <laughs> anyways, I think it's really um, the data bears out that, yeah, some really destructive, unhealthy stuff has been happening and is continuing to happen. And uh Yeah, it's just it's forming us in ways that I think we never intended and never wanted or desired. So, yeah, something important, I think, to pay attention to both for ourselves and for, uh, you know, generations to come. 
Wow. And I'm all about generations to come. That's that's the one main reason why I started Christian Podcast. It was not so mm. much about me. It was almost like trying to offer the church of the future um, a place where the church could still have a relevant voice. Mm. And, and, and I think, you know, that's why, I mean, the name, I, I keep saying this like in every show, but... You know, some people say, man, that's like the most boring name, like Christian Podcast, right? Now I added America <laughs> to make it more fun. <laughs> but uh, just Christian Podcast is like, that's the most boring name. I'm like, it's not so much about me. It's, it's really, I think we're never going to be able to separate Jesus from he is the Christ. And then Christ, it almost like evolves into Christianity, right? The followers of Christ. And I think that's what people with the online world are wrestling with, right? Like, mm. what is the what is the authentic image of Jesus? What does Jesus look like? What who what would he be like if he was here today? And why does Christianity sometimes doesn't at least from their perspective, right? From the skeptics or the the online natives or the digital natives, like you said, uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. It's like okay, that Christianity doesn't correlate. Uh, my view of Jesus, even though maybe they don't even know what their view of Jesus is because they haven't even approached maybe scripture or you know mm. something like that. But yeah. uh, I'm all about that, and I love that that you're you're saying it's forming us. And I'll say this, uh, Jim. I mean, K J J Kim. I always get it confused because it's the J and the Kim, <laughs> and I say Jim. Uh, but no, J. Uh, I, I actually graduated from communications not too long ago. I ended up oh, my, cool. my career in Mexico in 2004. Yeah. But it was because of COVID that I was able to finish my degree, my diploma. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I did it online. You know, I, I only, it was like all but dissertation pretty much. Uh, yeah. So I needed to do like the one final step. So anyways, 15 years later... Here I am doing an online graduation ceremony yeah. and all of that. And yeah, that's awesome. I went through some of the communication stuff because that's that's my degree. In, and there were some terms that surprised me, you know, like digital navies, like all this stuff. And I think in the in the book, and sorry that I'm making it so long, I want to hear from you. But um, in the book, you talk about how the internet is, we think we're using the internet, but it's really using us. Yeah. And, I think for me and for people who transition into, okay, now we're in an online world, that makes sense. But for the people that you're saying precisely, like the digital natives, how would they even know that they're being manipulated or used when this is like so normal to them? I mean, what do you have yeah. to say to that that world? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot written and talked about it. Um, you know, Tristan Harris, who... Uh, uh, leads the center for ethical technology or something like that he's a design ethicist and he he was one of the main people behind that documentary the social dilemma he's talked about this a lot he he says and i <laughs> this is a simple way to think about it he says you know most of our social media apps are free and we think that um they're they're just really accessible because they're free. You know, you don't pay for Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. You just download it on your phone or you go online, create an account, and there you go. You never, you don't pay anything. Um, and Tristan Harris, essentially, he says, nothing is free. If it's mm. free to you, it means you are the product. Wow. <laughs> you're the thing, like you, your attention, your information, your tendencies, what you like, what you dislike, all of those things. That's the stuff that's being sold, sold and bought, you know, in the, in the social media marketplace, like we are the products and uh, we don't think that way because I just, you know, I think that I'm going online and scrolling my feed and getting some content and a little entertainment for the boring moments of my day. But it's way more than that. There's a lot more happening beneath the surface. Again, a lot of people have written about this. Um, Tristan Harris has talked about it a lot. People like Jerron Lanier or Sherry Turkle, Nicholas Carr, you know, lots of names come to mind if anyone's interested in finding out more. But we are the products, like our, our tendencies, what we pay attention to, what we like, what we don't like, what we click on, what we don't click on, um, what we share and retweet and all those things. Like that's that's content that's being sold and bought, you know. Uh, and and if that is true, and it is true then we have to be aware that products are hardly ever in control. So 
we think that we're in control when we go on social media, but mm. pr- we're really not. Um, uh, the whole thing is very well curated and crafted to sort of design a particular type of experience to, um, you know, uh, evoke a particular type of response from us. Now, I'm, that's not all bad. I, what I'm not saying, and and people sometimes misunderstand my work. What I'm not saying is technology is evil and you should throw everything away and go live on a farm and garden, you know, all day. Although if that's what God's calling you to do, great. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be mindful and thoughtful so that we can put technology and digital technology and social media, especially, we can put it in its rightful place. We can implement the right parameters and the right uh, sort of disciplines in our lives, the right practices so that um, we don't allow these tools to form and shape us in ways that we don't want to be formed and shaped. Um, And instead, invite God by His Spirit to form and shape us into His image. Wow, I love that. Even though it sounds, sounds, and and maybe that's even the intent of this podcast, it sounds a little Christian-y, but but actually, I was thinking like, what is the audience for, especially for this episode? And I think... It's a little bit more of the Christians, even though hopefully some of the people that are listening and maybe the digital natives are like, wow, I didn't know that. They know that I'm, I'm a product of this, this enterprises and whatnot. Um, I think that would be maybe eye opening, but mm-hmm. also for the church people, right, that are trying to engage online. You know, after COVID, everybody went online and the people that didn't maybe lost their churches or closed down, mm-hmm. things like that. And now the... In, in, even a few years now, I was hearing this word like we need an online pastor, you know. And there's there's churches mm-hmm. that are doing that already. Like we need an online presence. Even here at my own church, we were discussing. Well, Beto, you're like the digital guy. Maybe you should be the <laughs> the online pastor somehow, right? And come at yeah. the F, the end of the service and then engage people online, uh, which is kind of like what I'm doing here, anyways. But do we really need a online? pastor yeah that's a good question i mean i I can't speak for other churches you know i I don't know their their ecclesiology their theology uh we don't have an online pastor here at our church we still stream our services but we try to make a pretty strong distinction the only reason we stream our services is because there are people who still you know two years in uh, have real concerns about gathering in person. And a lot of it's understandable with the uptick as we're recording this, you know, there's an uptick in COVID cases and hospitalizations, primarily because of all these variants that they're saying sort of can move around the, even, you know, the vaccines and all this stuff. So anyways, that's neither here nor there, but we we have online services primarily for those who still need it. Um, still want to stay connected. It's also a great front door. I've said that publicly. I think that, you know, uh, somebody recently told me um, your online is now your new lobby. In other words, brand new people, the, their first experience of your church community is not in the lobby of your building. It's online. So I think that's true. I think the data shows that that's true. So because of that, we maintain our our online service. But beyond that, we don't really... Like we don't call it an online campus. It's not a campus mm-hmm. or a congregation. It's literally the content of our service for somebody to watch. Mm-hmm. And that is great and it's helpful. And I think it's a, a good first step for some people, but that's not really what it means to be the church. You know, that's a very small part of the church. Uh, the church really is, in our view, an embodied people, you know, who are trying to do life together as closely with one another as possible. It's the body of Christ sort of learning to be family with one another, despite all of our differences. That's really hard to do online from the comfort of your own living room, you know? So um, again, I'm not against online necessarily. I just don't think that it's a complete full view of what it means to participate in the life of the body of of Christ. Uh, Mm -hmm. So we don't have an online pastor because we don't have an online campus. We just Mm -hmm. stream our services and Mm -hmm. uh, it's good for new people. Uh, it's good for those who are maybe traveling and they usually come, but they're on the road. They still want to stay connected with what we're teaching or preaching. That's great. You know, I love that. But uh, yeah, we don't have an online pastor, don't have an online campus. We just, we stream our service. And uh, I think that's kind of how we'll be for the foreseeable future. 
Wow. Do you do you think in that realm of you know, online pastoring and you know, maybe other churches doing it or even doing it even prior to COVID, right? There's some yep. churches that yeah. most of their own their presence was online anyways and uh, they were creating content, you know, and videos for YouTube, and like all this sort of stuff. Um, do you ever think that people who are in the online world, let's just say the digital natives, do you do you think that they ever feel like, you know, if, if the whole internet is, if I'm a product in the internet, am I a product of some church that's trying to reach me online? Uh, have you ever encountered that? Do, do you feel like some people could wrestle with that in the online world? Like, hey, these churches, they're just after my digital money, right? I mean, yeah. to get me to their service and then end up giving or something. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. Uh, what the, the question you just asked, there's, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, you know, I think when it comes to online church, most of the conversations I have with people, it's not so much that they feel like they're the product. But uh, I think one of the real dangerous things that happens is when you think about church simply as a service that you watch online, um, or really it's not just an online reality. It's like even for people who, who show up to church, uh, there's a real tendency to think about church as the church as a product. You know, this is where the whole concept of like church shopping or church hopping comes from. I mean, think wow. about that phrase, church shopping. You you wow. only shop for products, right? You you when you are shopping, you are a consumer. Mm. And I think that's one of the dangerous things that happens. Again, it's not that it only happens online, but I think thinking about church as online services to watch or consume um, accelerates this really dangerous misunderstanding that church is a product that I'm supposed to consume. And I am a consumer in the sort of Christian church marketplace. And nowhere in the Bible uh, does it like you can't you can't formulate that sort of ecclesiology or that sort of understanding of the church in the Bible. That's just not what the church is. The church is a family. It's a body. It's a gathered people. Literally, the church, the word church in Greek, ekklesia, means called out ones. It's people who are called out to a public space to gather and proclaim a particular message and to embody a particular message. So I, I think that that's one of the dangerous things that happens when we, we overly push online as like the place to go for church um, because almost everything we consume online is a product. It's content, but the church is not content. So yeah, in short, sort of that, that's, you know, I think that's mostly what I see that people mm -hmm. begin to think about the church as a product and not as a community wow. uh, where they're called to, to participate. Wow. Okay. So you, uh, there's, yeah, you've been talking about how the, the online is forming us in a sense. I think that's, that's what we mean when we say discipleship, right? If we're a Christian and we say, how are we discipling people? It's how are we forming people? And you're saying that the online, the social media, even the church itself It's in a way teaching us and forming us into into how our interaction is supposed to be in this like online reality. Even right now, right? Like we're on YouTube and this perpetuates yeah. here. And I mean, it's a strange world, but it's it's real. I mean, in a sense, it's real, right? And but you were using some powerful. I mean, the 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 statement about suicide and how it's spiking, it. It tells you a lot about where our society is finding itself at, right? So we're at the almost like the quarter of the 21st century, and it's incredible that that maybe 50 years from now, when we look back, we're gonna look at you no know, at the the rise of social media and like all these problems that we were encountering. Like, wow, back then we didn't know that. Blah 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 blah. Right? Yeah. And we're gonna fill yeah. in the gap. But you're talking about like something that's so powerful that I think has resonated. This is just my, my and I'm being biblical and maybe a Christian, right? Uh, but you were using super powerful words. You were saying, we think we are free. When, when something is free, uh, we think it's free, but it's, it costs somebody something, right? And, and if, if it's free, it's because we are the product. And I was thinking about that because I think that's the ideal of freedom, right? That we think we are in control. You even use that word. We think we are in control. 
And I think this is so important because I think in the book you elaborate on the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And when we think of a fruit of anything, you know, of any tree, it takes time. I mean, it takes it takes planting a seed. It takes like having the right seed, having the right ground, having the nourishing, having yeah. the you know the taking care, the pruning, the you no know, cutting back on the on the branches so that they grow better until finally it produces fruit. So yeah. I was thinking about that because we don't have an apple like we we right now at, at least as of now right we don't get an apple without a tree like a full grown tree. Yeah. Right. So is that That's is right. that what's translating into this digital world? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it's intentional that Paul in Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the spirit and it's intentional that over and over again the go-to metaphor for describing the life of discipleship, the life of being formed into Christ likeness throughout the New Testament is the metaphor of agriculture of gardening and of farming. Uh, I think that's true for many reasons. I think one of the primary reasons is because being transformed into Christ likeness, spiritual transformation, discipleship uh, is like, is like agriculture. It's like gardening, you know, in that it requires a lot of work and it happens really slow. You don't have fruit two days after you plant the seed. <laughs> you don't have vegetables, uh, you know, two days after you plant the seeds. You've got to, you've got to, in faith, plant the seeds beneath the, the soil. You continue to water and make sure it has sunlight and till the soil and, you know, make sure you do the work. And very slowly over time, as long as you continue to maintain, continue to give it the necessary work, and attention slowly over time, it begins to sprout leaves. And then slowly over time, it begins to give you fruit. And I think that's how it is. And it, the danger is that in the digital age, everything is so fast, you know, it's not a, we don't live in a, in a, a, a gardening culture. We live with a microwave mentality. I want to just pop it in the microwave, push a couple of buttons. And then two minutes later, I have a hot meal or whatever, you know, but we also know that the best meals are never microwaved. They're like cooked very slowly by grandma or something, you know, who's mm -hmm. slaving all day in, in the kitchen, cooking low and slow. Uh, and, and so, I, yeah, I think, I think that's the challenge in front of us. We just, most of us want to go really fast and uh, we can't when it comes to the spiritual life. You can't microwave it. You have to. You have to farm. You have to garden. Wow! When it comes to the spiritual life, you can't microwave it. That's deep right there. So, Jay, I'm thinking of the. So, if we're talking about internet, we're talking about this this uh, microwave approach to. I mean, to really our desires, right? Um, when it comes to the internet, I'm thinking of one of the. I mean, this this is like you said. It's maybe even dark. Um, but the reality of the internet as like the number one industry for, I mean, the number one place for the industry of pornography or for yeah. virtual sex or things like that, where yeah. when you think about it, like, let's just say we, we have like a overview perspective, like we are looking at humanity and see what's happening in the world. And we say, wow, it seems like these humans have a, a deep desire for, for a connection, right? And it seems like the internet had all the promises of we're going to be connected to one another, we're going to be in close you know, relationship. And to think that the number one industry of the internet is that of, of like sex, whatever, no sex. I, I think it involves like sex trafficking, pornography, uh, the lost of the flesh, the eyes, like you were saying in the book. Um, so in the reality of that, I think you were using some words like even psychosexual obesity. And then I was thinking, wow, maybe that just to, to pair these two concepts, like psychosexual obesity, like the, the desire to be pleased, even if it has to be online. Right. I I'm, I'm thinking of like even sexting, like this little, little, uh, phrases that we come up with that are related to like satisfying our, our flesh online. 
But then to pair that with with the reality of like analog sex, like sex is meant to be analog, right? And I, I, I'm even remembering that movie. I think it was the Demolition Man, where <laughs> no this this guy and the woman are trying to have sex. He's like, you want to have you want to have an encounter, right? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, right? And he comes from the past, and then they put on a headset. And it's all virtual. And he's like, "What? What's up? You know, I'm I'm used to the analog sex interaction." Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, what do you think of that? Uh, or can you illuminate us a little bit on what is the psychosexual obesity? What is this like online lust of the flesh? Yeah, I mean, psychosexual obesity. It's a term that was coined by a, a writer. And what's really interesting, I, I talk about it in the book. What's really interesting is this writer is uh he's a polygamist so he's not like some conservative you know like oh yeah sex is reserved for marriage he doesn't have like a christian ethics of sexuality at all he's a polygamist he believes that human beings were made to have sexual intimacy with multiple partners at the same time and um and that's what was so fascinating to me that even someone like that looks at the digital age and he that's his that's his phrase. Wow. He says, basically, we are inflicted with a sort of what he calls psychosexual obesity. What he means is sexuality and sex and sexual intimacy has been so perverted by the internet, essentially, that we are just gorging ourselves, you know? And he's talking specifically about pornography, but other things as well on this sort of really um, distorted, broken version of a good gift that God gave us, you know, sexual intimacy that that is to be experienced and celebrated between, uh, you know, um, a husband and wife in a committed monogamous relationship, a covenantal marriage before God. Uh, and we've just completely undone that. And now sexuality and sexual intimacy is just, you know, it's about what you can watch it, you know, online uh, with pornography and also in hookup culture with, you know, Tinder and whatever else. So essentially what he says is we're not becoming more sexual. We're becoming less sexual. We just don't know it. Wow. Uh, because sexuality is not this. It's not this. Ver- this is something else. It's like some really distorted, uh, perverted version of something really good. And I think, again, the data is bearing that out. What's really fascinating is um, Jean Twenge talks about this in her book, iGen. Uh, she, she, and she's a data scientist, you know, it's like big data stuff. She says that younger generations, millennials, gen, uh, Gen Z, especially in in younger generations, you know, the concern about younger generations 20 years ago was that, oh no, the internet is here. And now young people are just going to like find each other and have sex too much. You know, Mm. what the data is showing is that young people are actually having less sex than ever. Uh, They're going out less than ever. They're spending more time at home than Ooh. previous generations at their age. So the concerns uh, have proven false. But what is happening is um, pornography consumption is just astronomical now. Mm. And so wow. uh, you think about that. Um, what a lot of researchers are basically saying is actually what the internet has done has not made it so that young people are just hooking up with each other more. The internet has made it so that they are satiating their sexual urges in these really perverted ways through pornography and other ways. And then in real life, they're unable to actually have meaningful connection. So if you think about it, it, in the digital age with younger generations, what's happening is younger generations are unable to connect with real humans. Wow. And so sexual urges and desires are just being perverted and distorted into these digital, digital physical experiences through pornography. And I, I, I think this is going to have like this, like absolutely utter destructive ramifications for generations to come unless we get really mindful and intentional about it um, as parents and as leaders, for sure. Wow. 
Oof, that is so powerful right there. It's almost like a, I think you even said that this is, this book, it's almost like a, a what is it, a call, a wake up call in a sense, but you're also offering a lot of hope. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that, you know, that you're a voice that's concerned, but at the same time, you're offering solutions. So you're not only pointing to the problem, you're saying, no, we need to be analog, right? So you're even bringing yeah. voices that not necessarily from the, from the Christian community that are also saying, hey, we, we better watch out with what's happening with our online reality or online virtual reality. So, okay, so the last story I want to hear from you before you know, I go to the, the last questions, which will be whatever you want to say. But uh, <laughs> my last kind of like story I wanted to hear, because I think it's so important because it came down to an analog conversation. But you said that you guys had a coffee shop in uh, and you're in the you're in the Silicon Valley, right? So you're mm -hmm. I mean you're surrounded technology and also you're super close to to San Francisco, which is I mean it has to do with a little bit of what I want to talk about, which is almost like the mecca of LGBTQIA plus. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you said that you had a coffee shop and there was this almost like people trying to boycott what you guys were doing because they found out about oh, okay, these guys are not affirming us, something along those lines. So can, can yeah. you tell us what the story was like and how it did resolve on like yeah. meeting yeah, face to face? Yeah, the story's in the book. So uh, you could read it in more detail there. But basically, um, this is at my previous church, which isn't here in the Silicon Valley. It's in a town called Santa Cruz, which is about 30 miles south or 30 minutes south. It's a beach town. Very, uh, it, we Our church and our coffee shop, which was at our church, was like a mile and a half down the road from uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz, which is one of the most progressive liberal uh, universities in the country. And um, we have a, we had and still have at both churches a, a particular theology of sexuality, human sexuality and marriage and all of those things. But it's not like we, we flaunt it. And every, if anybody asks, we're, we're very clear, but it's not like that was like, you know, the hill we were dying on or anything. Anyways, long story short, the LGBTQIA student group at the university found out that we have a particular theology of sexuality and they they decided that meant we were bigots and we hated mm -hmm. LGBTQIA people, and which is utterly not true. We were actually quite clear about um, our love for all people because of God's love for all people. Anyways, long story short, they sent us a pretty nasty email and basically said they were going to begin a campaign to boycott our coffee shop. And our coffee shop was full of UC Santa Cruz students all the time. And so initially when I read the email, I got really upset um, because I felt really misunderstood and misrepresented. But instead of responding in anger because of God's grace, I took a deep breath, a spirit sort of gave me some calm and some peace. And I tried to email back in the kindest, most generous way possible. I thanked her for sending us the email. I did tell her, hey, this is not our posture. Um, and I would love, if you're willing, I would love to buy you a cup of coffee at our coffee shop and just talk face to face. And so she, to her credit, she said yes. And so we, we eventually met, we had coffee and we still disagreed on our position, but we were both surprised by our posture toward one another. There was laughter in the conversation. We talked about our families. There was a lot of uh, mutual sort of, um, you know, uh, there were things that we agreed on that we were both surprised we agreed on, you know? And mm -hmm. I just realized that would not have happened had I just sent a very blunt email. And even if I had sent a nice email, that would not have happened because a digital connection is just very different than an in-person one. So mm -hmm. I tell that story simply to say, you know, often when there's, you know, um, hostility toward one another, sometimes there's something beneath the hostility. There's pain or hurt or loss or grief or any number of things. And what I've come to realize is to, to unpack the thing beneath the hostility 
you you just can't do that digitally it it requires an embodied presence you know because it's more than just the words we say it's the sort of energy we embody with one another so uh yeah i would encourage that for anybody it, it, as much as you can um try to have the the important conversations in person you know rather than online wow that speaks to me volumes and i'll just say you know my last comment When COVID was you no know, happening, I remember like texting back and forth to some friends, and it was you no know, all about like the wearing masks, not wearing masks, you know, you're socializing or not socializing. And I said, I mean, at some point we got to see each other face to face because even the texting and all of that, it doesn't have the nuances, it doesn't have the the human connection. So even if we're super polite on our texting. It didn't include like the you're my friend and we can talk face to face and we would react differently than if we just go online and blast off you know, our ideas or our politics or whatever. And that's why I wanted you to talk about this, uh, this uh, a specific topic of the LGBTQIA encounter, because I think in the online world, that is massive. You know, the interaction mm -hmm. between the, the group of LGBT You know, the, the affirming, unaffirming, the I'm deconstructing yeah. from my faith, uh, evangelical, all of that. I feel like if we don't sit face to face and even disagree, but sit face to face and realize I'm in the presence of another human, yeah, we are going to be in a more chaotic place. So to summarize the episode, Jay, this is what we're going to do. You're going to tell me from your vantage point, what is the most blasphemous idea, the most far fetch from God that you can think of when it comes to the digital world or discipleship online? Oh, my gosh. Well, I don't think I would call anything blasphemous. I just am not that certain about my ideas. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know. I'm going to have to pass on that question. I don't know that any, I'm very open. I think that, uh, I, I feel very strongly about my ideas, but it's not like a matter of orthodoxy. Wow. I'm very open to the possibility that I'm wrong about X, Y, and Z. I've been wrong many times before in my life. I'm sure I'll be wrong about lots of things moving forward. Um, that is blasphemous, so. man. You need to be certain. You need to be certain. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So that's my answer. But that's the blasphemy is that love I'm it. open to the possibility that I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Love it. Okay. What are you skeptical of or where do you see skepticism played out? Yeah, I'm skeptical. I mean, based per, per this conversation, I'm skeptical that online church is the future. I don't think it is. <laughs> even though there's lots of people out there who say that it is. Love it. Okay. Inspiration. What gives you hope yeah i'm hopeful that uh god has been faithful to his bride the church for 2000 years he's seen the church through pandemics before wars dramatic shifts in culture and he's gonna see us through whatever comes our way next wow that's so good man um holy a holy idea oh my gosh uh followers of jesus are Um, the body of Christ. We are the new temple. So the spirit of God dwells in us, you know, and uh, that's holy ground. Not that we are divine or that we are holy in and of ourselves, but the righteousness of Christ sort of imputed, you know, the theological word over us. Um, yeah. So we should live as such that we are the temple and that God is, uh, he dwells with us and in us. Wow, we are the temple. Love it. And finally, divine. What is the most, the highest idea you can think of? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that would be like beyond this conversation. I just think the fact that a good God made a good world and he's going to make a, a good new world someday when Christ returns. That's it, right? That's the hope of, that's the hope of humanity. So I, uh, Yeah, I live with a healthy sense of fear and trembling before a divine God who made all things and will remake all things someday. So good, man. <laughs> okay, my friends, 
There you have it. Remember to visit ChristianPodcast.com. We'll have this conversation and all of our episodes right there for you to go deeper into. So, Jay, I mean, this book is not out yet, but people listen to this whenever they want anyways. So where do you want to point people to to find out more about your work? Oh. Yeah, the book comes out July 26th, so it comes out soon. We're recording this a week before the release. Uh, it's called Analog Christian. You can find it anywhere. Anywhere they sell books, Amazon or your local bookstore, or the, you know, uh, any online bookseller. So, yeah, I hope it's helpful to you. It is helpful, man. Congratulations. This is amazing. Like I said, even though you're a skeptical, but you're my favorite online pastor because I've only <laughs> met you online. Maybe when I met That's you right. in the analog, then you'll be my favorite analog pastor. <laughs> there you Is go. that fair That's to say? Awesome. <laughs> It's fair to say. Absolutely. I'm with you. Okay. Thank you, brother. Very Thank you so cool. much. Thanks. Thanks, I'll Beto. I'll see you guys Take on care. the next one.